David Hume? Oh no, it's the Hume of Doom! Broadly speaking, David Hume's contribution to moral philosophy was to suggest that morality is a. a matter of natural psychology and b. a matter of motivational desire rather than rational belief. Although naturalistic approaches to psychology, such as mine, tend to reduce mental states like desires to non-intentional states like extended physical states, I nevertheless agree with you on both points. So, like him, I reject attempts to pursue morality in the manner of instruction, as some simple representation of things supposedly independent of the desires upon whose operations our morality is grounded. This rules out morality undertaken as divine instruction and as science. There are, however, I think, at least two misinterpretations of Hume's approach. Two misinterpretations which often pop up here on YouTube in the form of the supernatural right and in the form of the anti-science left. At first blush, it may seem as if Hume's moral philosophy is a gift to those who'd claim that any moral reflection undertaken without divine guidance will just degenerate into expressions of subjective hedonistic opinion. Thus, there are those who accuse Hume of pretty much giving up the sceptical empiricist game by admitting that morality is just a matter of one's private passions. What, they may ask, if those passions happen to be those of Adolf Hitler, a paedophile, or a paedophile Adolf Hitler? Would that make molesting and gassing Jewish children moral? Hume there, keen to point out, didn't give any explanation as to the supposed intersubjectivity of our moral passions, beyond merely citing their apparent commonality. Thus, without any further explanation, the universality of Hume's morality seems, at least to those disposed to reject it, or more particularly what they take it to represent, so fragile and woolly in its dependence upon private sentiment, as to constitute no real morality at all. The fate of Hume's secular, sceptical and empirical morality is thus, they crow, the fate of all moral systems so foolish as to attempt to proceed without divine command. Inescapable and irreparable subjectivity, which is a recipe for political decadence and moral chaos. Their solution is more God, in the classroom, the courtroom and the assembly room. On the other hand, some romantic folk on the political left seem to fancy getting naked up the old apple tree with Billy Blake and railing against the satanic mills of scientism. Science, they'll spit, is just white male power, part of the technocratic disenchantment of modern life, or an ongoing programme of utilitarian dehumanisation. Most of us have met hipsters like this, some of us may even have been them. From their point of view, if not his, it feels good to claim Hume as an ally in the struggle to liberate the good from the rationations of an exploitative scientific institution, by which they typically mean any empirical research whatsoever whose conclusions, though warranted, threaten dissonance with their ideals. Thus, Hume's well-argued assertion that we cannot undertake morality in the manner of a science is seized upon as a claim that science ought to be mute on matters moral. If I'm honest, I find this group the more annoying, because ultimately they make the left look puerile and irresponsible. Pissy coffee shop diatribes about the state of identity politics on Reddit might seem legit to the cool kids, but ultimately in the real world, the only minority they serve to emancipate by marginalising the left in general is the one that has more money than everybody else put together. Given that he was working in the early 18th century and had to start off with the moral sentimentalism of Shaftesbury and Hutchinson, Hume did an outstanding job in presenting the passions in such a way as to be able to ground his moral philosophy on them. 
We, however, living in the 21st century and with considerably more empirical inquiry to our credit, can improve on, without distracting from, Hume's account of what we would now call desires. With that in mind, here's what's wrong with the supernatural right and the anti-science left. The mistake of the supernatural right nowadays is their failure to realise that they're hostages to a fortune that's already decapitated them. Thanks to the cognitive sciences, anthropology, history and the general conceptual consequences of Darwin's insights, we already have some idea as to how desires may not simply be private occurrences within one's head. Particular desires, or types of desire, for example, seem to share functions and even to some degree biological realizers amongst all creatures so similarly situated as to have them. And their famously rich phenomenology and higher order functionality promises to be tractable via the anthropological and historical sciences. There is thus some prospect of our being able to account for the universality of moral desires, without having to admit anything supernatural. This prospect alone is enough to refute the claim that, as a matter of conceptual necessity, we must either choose a supreme creator deity or face subjective moral chaos which is essentially what the supernatural right want us to believe. Therefore, the supernatural right is wrong. The mistake of the anti-science left is to assume that just because we cannot do morality as if it were a science, science ought to have no voice in moral discourse whatsoever. This is wrong because of practical reasoning, the way we think about what we're going to do, including whether it's right or wrong. All such thought is undertaken in the context of a theory, a model, a plan, a map or a story. It thereby involves not only desires, but beliefs. Beliefs whose truth is significant to the quality of the theory, etc. in question, and thus to the quality of the evaluations made therein. Therefore, as science is our best means to truth, science has a voice in our moral deliberations. Acknowledgements of practical reasoning are not unknown in Hume's writing, even in the midst of his most vociferous pronouncements as to the redundancy of reason. Where a passion is neither founded on false suppositions, nor chooses means insufficient for the end, the understanding can neither justify nor condemn it. Or, a passion must be accompanied with some false judgment in order to be unreasonable, and even then it's not the passion, properly speaking, which is unreasonable, but the judgment. Therefore, any protestation from the anti-science left as to how science ought to be banished from moral philosophy because of Hume is, I'd say, a misinterpretation. So you know what? There is no Hume of doom. Hume was a good guy who showed us where morality lives and what it's made of. And in light of what we know now that he didn't then, his moral philosophy neither opens the door to moral anarchy nor closes it to science. In fact, alongside Aristotle and Darwin, I, as a virtue ethicist, find you much more interesting a moral philosopher, given our present predicament, than the likes of Kant or Bentham. But hey, that's just my scientistic middle-aged white male opinion. You can come back now, he's gone. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.